If you hate stupid HOAs and love to see them get taken down, this video is just for you. HOA board demanded my supplies and entry to my home during the 2021 winter power outage. Attempted break-in when I refused. Posted by I'm Just a Neighbor. I live in a neighborhood that an HOA was formed in over a decade ago. I was essentially raised by my grandparents because my own parents really didn't want me and just wanted my little sister, whom they repeatedly said was the one they did not regret. I was born from an accidental teen pregnancy, and my parents showed very little love for me. So from age of 10, my grandparents raised me, and they left me their house when they passed away. I never married, and just wasn't interested, but I am a bit of a paranoid man with keeping supplies stocked. When COVID hit, I already had a generous supply of soap, sanitizer, toilet paper, paper towels, disinfectant, bottled water, canned food, medical supplies, and even whiskey. And I still keep all of that well stocked. But it was from years of buying that stuff little by little. I also have a generator and a generous supply of filled propane tanks for heat and some insulated sleeping bags. <laughs> I wish I had a wood stove too. But the house wasn't built with one. The HOA and I also did not get along. My grandparents turned down their invitation to join, and so did I when I inherited the house. Most of the time, the HOA left me alone. However, back then, the president would come to our door to say something whenever he had a bone to pick with us. It never got him far, and I did kind of find it amusing to see how my grandpa would send him packing. When the pandemic hit, word spread about my stash of supplies. I willingly shared it with some of my neighbors and friends, but certainly not with anyone on the HOA board as they've been a thorn in my family's side for years. When the HOA was formed, they demanded for months that my grandparents join, and they had the balls to try numerous underhanded tactics, all of which I documented in various ways. They thought they could pick on an elderly couple and say they were members whether they liked it or not. They stated rules that they completely made up and repeatedly threatened us even saying they would come into the house to take away our guns because the HOA didn't approve of any firearms. We checked their bylaws, and there was nothing about guns on it. In fact, they were trying to force the same thing on some of the other residents, all of whom fought back. And that fake bylaw was soon dropped when there were talks of rebellion. But the HOA still didn't leave us alone. I convinced my grandparents to let me install CCTV so I could catch every further interaction of the HOA board showing up, demanding my grandparents join and threatening them. This turned out to be a very good idea as the HOA attempted to have all three vehicles towed from my grandparents' driveway. We confronted the tow truck driver that was attempting to take my grandpa's old wagon and he said to take it up with the HOA as they were authorized to tow from them. When we told them that our house was not a part of the HOA, the driver didn't care and took the car anyway. We called the police to get the car back, and the police had to talk to the HOA board who were forced to admit being in the wrong as they were all sniveling cowards. The police then had some words with the tow company and they brought the car back free of charge. The tow driver glared at us after he put the wagon back and he never returned. Well, that incident was the final nail in the coffin, and my grandpa started a lawsuit against the HOA board for harassment, and when their lawyer saw my pile of evidence, he told them to just settle out of court. The HOA paid the court and lawyer fees, and my grandparents got a few grand on top of that. From then on, the HOA board stayed far away from us, but there was obvious animosity. They even tried to get our neighbors to shun us, which did not work out. When I inherited the house from my grandparents, the HOA already knew me well, and they didn't really bother to try and pull the same stunts of harassment they had before with my grandparents. But they did try once to empathetically suggest I join, but I told them to kick rocks and I'll leave them alone if they leave me alone. If not, they were free to answer to my 12 gauge and police, as I'm not the type of person to hesitate in defending myself or calling the cops if the HOA starts making trouble with me. I would also have no problem suing for harassment like my grandparents did. <laughs> it was clear to them that leaving me alone for the moment was the better choice. So that was supposed to be the last time I had any trouble with them, at least until the incident a couple of years later that I'm about to describe. As supplies became available again in late 2020, I replenished my stock. 
However, the 2021 January ice storm hit my area hard, and we were without power for over a week in the dead of winter. And I was the only person in the neighborhood properly prepared for it. I had some neighbors with generators, but many of them ran out of gas to generate power within a few days. My generator wasn't enough to power my whole house, just key things like my fridge and freezer, my microwave, and a few other necessities. I kept my house warm with propane, and I had battery-powered lighting, plenty of books to read, portable DVD players, my laptop, and I had a large number of filled propane tanks in a variety of sizes at the ready to keep warm with. So I was A-OK. -okay. My neighbors? Not so much though. No one could drive anywhere. It was about minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit outside, if not colder. There was debris everywhere from fallen trees, and the ground was covered in a sheet of very slippery ice that was on top of snow. And there were many fallen trees, some of which completely blocked the roads. My next door neighbors, who were friends of mine, were having a very hard time keeping warm. At the time, they had a baby who was only a few months old, and they were not prepared for the outage at all. And there was one more family across the street whose house had a tree fall on it. So I invited both families into my home. I also took in a retired elderly couple from a few houses down that were freezing because they had no form of heat. All of those people stayed with me for the duration of the outage. I invited the first family over right after the power went out because I knew they were not prepared. And the family whose house was damaged by a tree I brought over while the storm was still going on in the middle of the night. When the tree landed on their house, it took out an entire section of it and exposed the inside of the house to the elements. The father of the family came to me in a panic and I tied a rope to my porch and we made our way to his damaged house to get his family back to mine. We used the rope to pull ourselves back to my house because of all the ice, darkness, and storming frozen winds. I managed to get the whole family over, and after the storm was over, they also brought what supplies they had, including more propane, another generator, and more gasoline they'd been storing. That all went pretty far for heating and powering my house. I had more than enough supplies for all of us, and collectively, we had a myriad of electronic devices to use, many of which were rechargeable, but I had a lot of batteries for those that weren't, and those were great at keeping kids entertained. They also had handheld gaming devices of their own, and we were able to keep charged thanks to the generators. I wasn't used to living with other people since my grandparents died, but it felt good to help them out. Then, there was an elderly couple down the street all referred to as George and Gracie that came to stay with me too. They were good friends of my grandparents, so I checked in on them and found out that they had no heat without electricity and were sitting in a running car just to use the heater in that. George had just barely managed to chip off enough ice to get the car door open so they could sit in it. I brought them in, and they sort of became like the temporary grandparents of the house and helped look after the kids. The HOA board, though, was somewhat aware of my supplies, and they could easily see my house was thriving during the outage. So they came over in a group to talk to me on the second day of the outage. They had some idea of having everyone in the HOA board go stay in one building, and they wanted that building to be my house, because I already had supplies and heat. I told them that I wasn't hosting their group in my home. I was already taking care of two families and an elderly couple not related to me, and that was enough. I got a lecture on being neighborly from them, but I just lectured them back that I had made my decision and to look for somewhere else to bundle up. And besides that, I clearly did not trust them for obvious reasons. And they were the last people in the neighborhood that I'd let into my home. Then I shut my door in their faces. If I had hosted all of those entitled people and their families, my house would have been beyond crowded and all of my supplies would have been taken from me. In situations like those, people will resort to taking and calling it sharing. <laughs> I wasn't about to risk that but I did still hand out water and sanitizer to neighbors that came by. The HOA board wasn't done with me though. On the third day of the outage, they crowded at my house with their families demanding to be allowed entry into my home. I told them I had no room and to leave me alone. The HOA board 
didn't take no for an answer though, and they tried to force their way in. Ha, but I am not a small man. I knocked their leader right down and off my porch and told them that if they tried that again, I'd make sure to notify police later. I was then backed up by the other men I'd taken in, and they were armed. The HOA president yelled at me that they were all freezing and they needed entry. But I was already hosting 10 people in my house and giving out supplies to neighbors. I wasn't going to take on any more. Then I told the HOA board to leave or I'd be getting my shotgun. Well, after they left, the two dads, George and I, had a bit of a meeting and decided we needed to take turns keeping watch. I'll refer to the dads as Dad 1 and the other as Dad 2 in the order of which I invited them over. And George as George, of course. For an old man in his 70s, he had some strength and grit to him like a man 20 years younger. We all agreed there was no way those butts of the HOA board would take this all lying down times like this, men will become animals to get what they want. So, we all started taking shifts guarding my house and supplies. I slept on my couch with my 12 gauge next to me, and on that very night, I got woken up by Dad 2, who was currently on watch yelling for me. I came running into the garage to find Dad 2 against the garage door and holding it shut. He said there were people outside trying to force it open. It was right about that moment we heard a very loud gunshot. It turned out to be George at my back door. He'd grabbed his own shotgun that he'd brought from his house and fired it into the air outside when he caught two men in my backyard trying to get in through my door. Dad one woke up and came running out to help and we all ran into the backyard. We found my side gate had been forced open. The old latch had been broken. We made our way out front from there and saw roughly 10 people trying to run across the road with weapons in hand like bats and claw hammers and crowbars, and they were repeatedly slipping and falling on the ice that covered the road. All of them were the HOA board members and people related to them like their teenage sons or brothers. We blinded them all with 1000 lumen flashlights and rounded them up at the edge of the sidewalk. We had them all drop their weapons and George mused that we should break a few of their fingers just to scare them a bit more. They all begged us not to report them to police, and I said to never come back or the next time somebody might get shot. They skittered off like frightened children trying to run across an ice rink. We did a makeshift repair on my gate to keep it closed, and the rest of the week all four of us spent nights on guard. We played lots of cards and board games, drank whiskey, and did regular patrols around the house. No one from the HOA board came back to bother us. There was an occasional knock for help from someone needing something though, and the neighbors were really needing water and I was running out of it. So I'd taken to melting ice in pots and boiling it with an electric hot plate, then filling jugs. That gave several of my neighbors clean drinking water. The rest of the outage was otherwise uneventful until the thaw kicked in and more stuff started falling as the ice broke apart. When the ice and snow had all cleared up, the widespread damage was pretty evident. It took the county months to clean up all the debris. We found out later that the other neighbors had followed our example and basically banded together three or so families per home to try and stay warm and share supplies. Pretty much, the whole of the HOA board wasn't welcome to join in since they were hated by pretty much everyone by that point. So they all had to band together in the one house they owned that had a wood-burning stove. And they burned pretty much anything they could get their hands on, some of which they took from neighbors. There was evidence of repeated thefts and vandalism all over the neighborhood. Haha, <laughs> and the key suspects were the HOA board and their families. But none of the neighbors could prove it was them. My CCTV was off due to the power being out, but we made sure that all of our neighbors knew we'd caught the HOA board trying to break into my house. After the power was finally back on, there was a lot of work to do. Like Dad 2 making an insurance claim to fix his house. Dad 2's family actually ended up staying with me for a while longer before the home repairs could really get started. George and Gracie's old house suffered a few broken pipes due to the freezing cold. <laughs> but George is a retired plumber, so he handled it. A large limb had fallen on Dad 1's car and did enough damage that it was later considered totaled. 
I didn't really have any time to help any of them out much as I had to go back to work a couple days after the power was back on and I was kept very busy for a while. Being sick of the HOA board, the bulk of the neighborhood filed in February to have an emergency HOA meeting and in said meeting they wanted the entire board to resign. They refused to step down and the residents had to get lawyers involved. It did go to court, and the HOA itself was found to be violating the law several ways and embezzling funds. The entire HOA was shut down pending a full investigation. <laughs> At first, it was just a temporary shutdown, and then it became permanent. All of the former board members have left the neighborhood, and I ended up making some great friends with Dad 1 and Dad 2, and we're regular backyard drinking buddies. I pay a visit to George and Gracie now and then too. They've all taken to keeping supplies like I have as well, just in case this sort of thing ever happens again. This story of a terrible HOA is called, Can't Build a Bridge Across the Supply Ditch? Move Your Supply Ditch, posted by Snow Inferno. The backstory. My grandfather owned some 14 acres of land. There was a state-owned water supply ditch running between the top half and the bottom half of this acreage. To use official roads to get from the top half to the bottom half required a five-mile detour that Gramps had had enough with. The History A neighbor had been granted the appropriate permits and everything required to build a bridge across the supply ditch a half a mile or so up the ditch. A neighbor of his was disgruntled with the bridge, hooked up some chains to his tractor and pulled that sucker down right into the supply ditch. The state or county banned building bridges across the supply ditch because of this jerk and the debris that was dropped into the supply ditch. The compliance. He'd had enough driving 10 minutes around to get to the other plot of land and decided that he wanted to build this bridge. Upon learning of the prohibition of bridges across the ditch, he took it upon himself to resurvey his land and the rights granted to the state for the supply ditch to bisect his property. It turned out, the state built this ditch just 20 feet away from the actual right-of-way that was granted to them for the ditch. He got into a lengthy fight over it with the water board and it finally came down to an ultimatum. Let me build my bridge or move your supply ditch to the proper location. Ultimately, he won this battle and that summer began construction of the abutments and purchased a railroad car which was cut in half and the halves placed side by side across the abutments and the supply ditch. I still remember going out to his farm that summer and sandblasting those railroad cars and then painting it with a special paint to prolong the life of the bridge. The Epilogue Years after the bridge was built, the land above the ditch was subdivided and placed in an HOA, the bridge being the property of said HOA. Parcels of the subdivided land were sold off and people moved in and built homes in this HOA. These fools couldn't be arsed to meet once a year, have an official minutes of this meeting and pay a minimal amount to keep the HOA running and the bridge under their control. Dad and I went out there to try and fix it up after they let this crap lapse and got everything reinstated. Everything is hunky-dory again and these morons are warned that we're not traveling halfway across the country again to fix their screw up. What did they do? They let that crap lapse again. The HOA is dissolved and as far as we know, the bridge now belongs to the county who can open it up for public use so everybody above the ditch can make use of it instead of driving five miles around to get to the main highway. Roommate stole from me, so her wallet vanished, posted by Charming University 98. Back in college, I had better credit than my three other roommates, so I put our internet and TV under my name, otherwise the deposit would have been $600. The cable company offered me a $300 Visa gift card upon sign up. Two months later, I called them because the gift card never arrived. They tell me they sent it a few weeks ago, and eventually I am able to find out from Visa that someone used it at the Whataburger, Target, and liquor store near my house. I'm ticked off because obviously one of my roommates has used it, but I don't know which one. A few weeks later, roommate number two complains that their $200 birthday gift card to Target has gone missing. His mom still had the receipt, and the store was able to tell her that someone used it at the Target near our house. 
He's obviously ticked off too, but we've now realized it's probably one of the other two roommates. A couple of weeks after that, roommate number three's wallet disappears. We turn the house upside down looking for it, and we knew it had to be in the house because her car key is attached to her wallet and her car is parked at the house. She is absolutely frantic, sobbing, screaming, hyperventilating, and so on, throwing crap everywhere and just having an absolute meltdown while tearing the house apart. We had never seen her behave like this, so we're all kind of surprised that she'd be that upset about her wallet. It's stressful, sure, but I genuinely was concerned about how she was reacting. She says the gift card thief must have taken it, implying that it's roommate number four, the only person who hasn't had something stolen yet. A few days after that, I found her wallet in the trunk of my car. We had gone to get groceries together, and I guess she just laid it in the trunk while we were unloading. I'm like, holy crap, I found her wallet. And then I open it up because I'm just excited to confirm that I did indeed find her wallet. Bam! Both stolen gift cards, front and center. No doubt. The Visa gift card has my name printed on it, and roommate number two's mom had written something in Sharpie on his gift card. I realize she had a meltdown because she was afraid we would find out that she was the thief. I left the wallet, cash and all, right where it was, pushed up against the inner lip of the trunk so you couldn't see it unless you leaned farther into the car. The locksmith wouldn't make her new keys without the title, and the title was in the glove box of her locked car. All in all, she spent about five hundred dollars replacing her driver's license title and keys not to mention not being able to drive her car for two weeks i moved out of state with her wallet still in my car finally tossed it in the trash several months later sometimes the universe assists you with the petty revenge i did not expect this to take off sorry if you see this chelsea it was me this happened 10 plus years ago and I'm happy to report that we've all gone to therapy since then and are thankfully no longer terrible human beings. Now a couple of things to address here. Why didn't I confront her? I hated confrontation, was a huge people pleaser and wanted everyone to like me and enjoyed watching her suffer. Again, therapy. I'm thankfully no longer like this. Visa gift cards don't have names. Google Comcast Visa promo card real quick. The Target gift card itself said happy birthday and my friend's mom wrote to my favorite son underneath. It was still semi-legible when I found her wallet. Locksmiths don't make car keys? Apparently some do. In the end, she had her car towed to the dealership. I do remember she called a locksmith the first day her wallet was missing because she initially thought the wallet was in her car. She was super mad that the locksmith charged her for the weekend visit without actually unlocking her car. Was he taking advantage of a stupid college girl? Maybe, this was over a decade ago. I was 21 and I'm sure my vodka addled brain did not fully absorb the details of her whole ordeal. Turn her into the cops. Bro, have you met college students? Do you know how much illegal crap they do? It briefly crossed my mind, but petty revenge was far more satisfying. She had an absolute meltdown and missed a few days of work at a newish job dealing with all this. Commenter says, she left the stuff she stole in your car and kept her title in the glove box. She's a dumb thief. And OP says, extremely. Yeah, some people have their eyes set on something so hard they neglect everything else and do stupid stuff. I led a revolution against our petty HOA board. Posted by Deleted. My wife and I moved into a 64 townhome community that was 10 years old at the time. The HOA board was comprised of five members that were original homeowners when the community started and had been the sole board members since the community started. Their sense of entitlement was that crazy. They thrived on their quarterly walkthrough of the neighborhood as they would write up every single home for some kind of violation, regardless of how minor the offenses were. Everyone gets a violation letter. Our first letter, the first month living there, was that our garage door paint was starting to peel. It was a two centimeter scrape where the panels met. It needed to be repainted, the siding needed to be power washed, there was a patch of green moss behind a bush, and the sliding door on the deck was dirty. There was dirt on the bottom of the door from recent rain. And it needed to be washed. 
we had 30 days to fix the issues or begin accruing a fee of $25 a day until they are resolved. I asked around and everyone gets these ridiculously petty letters every quarter. No matter what you did to maintain your townhome, you were going to get a letter about something. As this was going on, none of the major items the neighborhood needed fixed were addressed. After a decade since the construction, the ground had settled unevenly and many homes had standing water issues where it wouldn't drain after a storm. The rainwater would sit for five to seven days in people's lawns. And more importantly, there had been a legal fight with the town since the community was started about our road being dedicated, meaning the town was responsible for snow removal. Our HOA dues included paying for our own snow removal, which we shouldn't have to, and we were paying an attorney for 10 years to fight this with no resolution in sight. Fast forward two years, and a few of us had enough and decided to band together to replace the board at the next annual meeting. The existing board got wind of this and hit us all with pages worth of issues with our properties, since if you have outstanding issues, you are not in good standing with the community, thus cannot run for a board position or even vote for those running. This petty move brought the community even closer and we all spent the weekend before the meeting helping each other clean out their HOA honeydew list. We took pictures, documented everything, then we had the US mail certified delivery of each packet with the completed list and photos to the HOA board who lived 75 feet away. Come board night, oddly enough, the lawyer was there to give an update that no progress has been made with the township on dedicating our road. He stuck around as we moved to the elections for the next board. We brought our signed petitions to add our names to the ballot. The board says we're not eligible as we all have outstanding issues with our property. We call BS with our receipts from the post office that they received our completed list with documentation. They reply that they haven't reviewed them yet. We tell them that's not our problem and we are in good standing. The lawyer overhearing this states that we are eligible to be on the ballot if we can confirm the issues with our homes were resolved prior to the meeting. The HOA president glares at the lawyer, but the lawyer just shrugs saying the rules are the rules. With the exception of the five existing board members voting for themselves or each other, we are voted in nearly unanimously to replace them. I lead the revolution because I was tired of the petty BS when there were real problems in the neighborhood. Sadly, the rest of the elected board members vote me as president. I have no idea what I'm doing. But we spent the next few sessions removing all the dumb violations from most of the neighbors. We went through the bylaws to really focus on what's important. What happens next? Ends up that the lawyer was a friend of the previous president and was in no hurry to resolve anything as he was enjoying our excessive bill. I notify him if it's not resolved in the next six months, we're finding new representation. He was actually good at his job when pressed to do it. He won the case. The town appealed and tried to drag it out. He fast-tracked the appeal as it had been going on for 10 years and we won the appeal too. The town dedicated our road and then the lawyer pressed that it should have been done years ago. It wasn't him slowing things down, but the town. He ends up getting us a settlement from the judge for back pay on us paying the snow removal that the town was responsible for. We ended up using that settlement to have French drains installed across much of the community to clear the standing water issues. With the money left over, we fixed a lot of the neighborhood issues that the HOA should have been doing the whole time. Fences and sidewalks in disrepair, replaced dead trees and shrubs and so on. Yeah, it was great getting all of that done without having to hit our capital reserve fund. I remained president until we moved a few years ago. Our family began to outgrow the townhome and now we live in a new, larger development with a new HOA. I was asked to run for a position on it and I replied, not a freaking chance, but I will lead a coup if I need to. An update on the HOA president. 
One minor update on what happened to the former HOA president that I replaced. The original HOA president, a 50-year-old male, wasn't actually eligible to be president. He wasn't on the mortgage. The townhome was in his mom's name. No one knew because he held the books. The best was at the next annual meeting. He shows up with his petition to try and get his position back. I tell him in front of the other 60 plus homeowners that he can't even be at the meeting, let alone vote or be on a ballot as his name isn't on the property. But his mom is eligible if she wants to. That, <laughs> that was embarrassing enough for the entitled little jerk. HOA board member threatening to sue the HOA if she's voted out or removed. Posted by Sweet Snowy. I live in an HOA in Georgia, and we have three HOA board members. They were voted on last year, and they are the first elected members since our neighborhood finished development. Let's call them Scott, Jerry, and Karen. I just had a long conversation with Jerry this morning. Anyway, apparently a bunch of our neighbors talked to Scott and wanted to remove Karen from the board because she's very controlling, has called the cops on the neighbors countless times regarding minor parking issues, which she herself or her guests violate from time to time, and basically thinks she owns everyone. And she recently installed seven cameras outside her house. Not sure if it's to monitor everyone or for her safety. Our area is super safe. But my impression is, it's for the former. Most want her off the board now. For the record, I personally don't have any beef with her, and I don't know all the issues our neighbors are complaining about, but I don't agree with how she's handled some situations. But then, when Scott filed a petition or something to remove Karen, nobody showed, I guess? But that leads me to what Jerry said Karen said about leaving the HOA board. She said that she's been keeping a list of all violations that she's seen since coming on the board, minor or major, and she will sue the HOA if she's voted out or removed from the board. I guess she heard about this petition or whatever it was, but can she blackmail us like this? Again, I never had personal beef with her, but I would and will vote for someone else next election time, and I'm reeling a bit about her threat. So again, this was all relayed to me. I didn't hear it from Karen herself, but is there anything we can do? Even without my vote, she'll definitely be voted out next time. I'm not on the HOA, and I do not want to be, nor do I have the time, but her threat is not sitting well with me. I do plan on thoroughly reading the HOA rules again as well, since I haven't read them since we bought the house. Curious if anyone's dealt with something like this before and what the outcome was. Do you agree with this commenter's answer? Since she's playing that card, the HOA should have its own attorney. It should also have liability insurance for its board members that will step in with defense attorneys when the board is sued. There are attorneys that specialize in representing community associations. Jerry and Scott should consult that attorney and get an opinion on whether a lawsuit would have any chance of success. My guess is that it won't, but I'm not a lawyer. Yeah, can Karen really be pulling this kind of crap? What do you think? Bought a no HOA home. Neighbor says there is one with updates. Posted by Bunny Girl 420 We bought our house a couple of months ago, and in the description, it said no HOA, and we never signed any HOA documents. The CCNR say there will be an HOA created, but there never was one created, and they were made in 2005. Yesterday, our neighbor, who we only met the day before, came to our door and said there is an HOA since we do want the neighborhood to look nice but we don't want to pay fees for it. Then we pointed out how some houses are completely unkept and she went on to complain about those but they still haven't fixed it so that makes me think she's bullcrapping. I see other houses with Zillow descriptions with no HOA right next door also. This is Washington State. If I didn't sign any papers and it still shows on Zillow no HOA in the description Am I safe and this lady's just unhinged? Thanks for any feedback, I'm a first time owner and I'd never buy a house in an HOA. Update. The title company confirmed the HOA was never established and in our deed, the seller specifically stated it's no HOA. Neighbors who have lived here for 10 years say there's no HOA. Other neighbors who just moved here also had her come to their house and they also say they signed nothing for an HOA. New neighbors requested paperwork for the HOA from her and received nothing. It seems that this lady is just trying to enforce the CCNRs, which is fine by me since I already signed and reviewed them. Final update. 
The situation's resolved. She made a neighborhood association that helps during Christmas and July 4th stuff, and she calls this an HOA. She's also trying to tell people what to do, but there is no HOA. Yeah, legally, if there is not one, you don't have to go by the rules. Nice job, OP. Overly restrictive HOA rules, posted by Bart84. I just bought a car from a woman who lived in a neighborhood where the HOA does not allow auto repairs. I wanted to install brackets on the front bumper of the car so I can tow it with my truck using a flat tow bar without having to use a dolly or a trailer. But I had difficulty that day cutting the metal bumper, so I told her that I needed to get the dolly after all, but the rental place wasn't open until 7am the next day. She flipped out and threatened to call someone to tow it if I didn't get rid of the car by 8 a.m. I ultimately removed the car using a dolly that next morning, which, in hindsight, was a much more convenient option anyway. But what shocked me and opened my eyes is how restrictive this neighborhood is. It seems to be an upper-class suburb, and residents are very aware of everything that goes on and will complain at the smallest hint of something that they don't like. What I was doing wasn't a repair, but an addition of a feature to a car. I guess that nuance can easily be missed. But I found out that the HOA already threatened to fine her that morning, probably because one or more of the neighbors complained. Either that, or she made it up to pressure me to remove the car ASAP because she didn't trust that I would keep my word. Regardless, I realized that I would never want to live in a neighborhood where neighbors are watching your every move and ready to report a complaint to the HOA at the first hint of something that they don't like. I can see the value in these rules because it ensures a good-looking and crime-free neighborhood. But oh my goodness, I would never feel comfortable living in such a place. I live in a downtown area where none of this is a concern. I can fix my car in the street, as people do all the time, and not get any negative feedback. I plan to move to a house with more land and a garage for me to do auto work, as I please anyway, but I never knew these restrictive neighborhoods existed. It taught me a lesson to choose wisely the next area I move into. Do you agree with this commenter, or are they wrong? Some HOAs are crazy, many are not. Yes, you should be careful about what the CCNRs are of the area in which you're viewing homes. What do you think? Home Accidentally Excluded from the HOA by Royal Nublet. My wife and I recently moved into a new build and we received a letter saying that our home was excluded from the HOA by mistake. The letter asked us to voluntarily join but didn't really say anything beyond that. As it turns out, an entire section of the neighborhood was accidentally excluded from the HOA, roughly 25%. I guess the covenants weren't attached to the homes before they were sold or something like that. All of the homes, including ours, were originally intended to be in the HOA, so we were just going to sign up anyway because we were already planning to be a part of it. However, once I find out how many homes surrounding ours also weren't in the HOA, I started having doubts. We're pretty much right in the middle of the no HOA homes, so my concern is that if we sign up, we'd be subjecting ourselves to enforceable rules that many of our neighbors wouldn't be subjected to. So far, only five of those homes have voluntarily joined. I realize the benefits of an HOA with helping to keep your neighborhood nice and funding improvements and whatnot, but then I've also heard stories of how they recently approved someone's paint color and then tried fighting it after it was painted because they didn't agree with the shade of the color they approved. That's the kind of pettiness that I don't want to subject ourselves to if our immediate neighbor can do the same exact thing with no repercussions. What to do? Has anyone else experienced this type of thing? An update. We're going to wait it out and not willingly join. If it comes to being forced to join somehow, then yeah, so be it. But yes, it does not make sense to willingly give up some rights just for the sake of joining with no benefits to it. It doesn't provide any benefits like mowing or trash or anything else like that. We'll just be good and mindful neighbors, as we usually are, and hopefully have no problems. We're even willing to make donations to the community fund and whatnot. For the most part, it seems like the current HOA board is hands off and may just let you be, but like many have said on here, board members change and it only takes one to muck things up. There's no telling what the future board will be like or what changes they'll propose. This commenter says, Dear HOA, LOL, no. Nice. HOA has $300,000 in reserves and isn't improving the neighborhood. Thoughts? Posted by Varen129. 
I'm a recent first-time homeowner in a fairly rural neighborhood as of January 2022, and I'm new to dealing with homeowners associations. Mine is behaving in a way that's left me frustrated with how they seem to be managing the yearly payments that we give them. But because I have no prior frame of reference for what's reasonable, I wanted to hear from people with more experience than I have. We pay our HOA 600 bucks each year, and at today's meeting, they revealed they have over $300,000 in reserve accounts, comprised entirely of yearly HOA fees. They've accumulated so much that they've actually opened investment accounts for it. I recognize that an HOA will want to have some reserves on hand in case of an emergency, and I'm not opposed to HOAs in general, but the amount at issue here seems excessive. There are also a number of neighborhood improvements that seem like they should have been done before the HOA started to invest the money. To give a few examples, our neighborhood runs on well water, and if the power were to go out for a long period of time, there's no generator on the pump that would allow homes in the neighborhood to keep running water. Grass in the common areas is only mowed a few times a year, and not always completely. There's a large field in our neighborhood where the grass is routinely allowed to grow over a foot in length without being mowed for long periods of time. Ticks are a big problem here. There's a retention pond near our home that's been broken for a long time due to a mechanical failure, causing the water level to significantly drop. People who bought their homes expecting something near water have also been disappointed. Instead of hiring an engineer, HOA leadership felt that they could fix it personally as a DIY project with rocks and concrete, which, of course, did not fix the issue. Before I consider doing anything else, I just want someone to tell me whether I'm being reasonable. I generally try pretty hard to view people in a good light, but this just seems like a very lazy and conceited HOA. If they have such a large surplus and they aren't using it for anything, the least they could do is suspend our yearly payment. On the other hand, if this is basically par for the course with HOAs, maybe I'm the one who's wrong. Commenter drops this answer. This is the right answer. Not for emergencies, not surplus. It is money set aside to replace existing components, not to perform routine maintenance. Do you agree? What's being coerced into maintaining common area landscaping by CEH Parrot. Less than a year into the new home, there has been a couple interactions with neighbors or the developer over a section of grass between a sidewalk and the street. At first, we were led to believe that was our grass and responsibility. Okay, so we mow and we weed eat it. One night after weed eating, I leave and I notice someone with a blower is blowing my area that I left some trimmings on the sidewalk. Okay, I get it, that should be kept clean. I find it kind of weird that they felt the need to do that, but uh, okay. Today I weed eat the section by the street and then I run to the store. Afterwards I need to blow it off still, but I'll do it when I get back. I am pulling out of my driveway and some guy in a truck stops in the street. He backs up and he rolls his window down to start literally yelling about the grass and the trimmings that need to be blown. I just say, yes, yes, I'll blow it away. And he yells, we have an HOA. His tone was pretty negative the entire time. Not the way you'd expect a stranger to speak to another stranger. Well, he doesn't even appear to live on my street. So this interaction rubs me the wrong way. I come back, I pull up the HOA regulations filed with the county, and I proceed to scour the sections about the common area and the owner landscaping responsibilities. Come to find out, the area in question is most definitely a common area, as defined in Article 1, Section D, and is to be maintained by the association, as defined in Article 1, Section E, and Article 4, Subsection 5. So I get it, that area is a common area. It should be clean and maintained professionally, as mandated in the HOA regulations. I'll leave it for the professionals. My mistake. Maybe I should send them a bill for 125% of my labor. I mean, they would send me one if I was in violation of my landscaping and they had to maintain it. Commenter says, don't give them the idea to fine you for doing unauthorized mowing and so on in a public area. And OP replies, touche. Yeah, don't give them any extra power over you because as we all know, HOAs never abuse their power, right? Corrupt Condo Association Counters Change, posted by B26354. I purchased my townhouse in the late 2000s. The previous owners were motivated to sell for a good price. It was exactly what I wanted. Two bedrooms, multiple bathrooms, and a garage. From the mandatory home inspection, I was told about several potential problems with the unit. 
Some were internal, and others dealt with an outside balcony, leaky windows, and cracked exterior paint. Before finalizing the sale, I was given the opportunity to ask about these issues and was told that I was responsible for everything inside the townhouse and the outside problems were handled by the condo association and I just had to submit requests for repair. The condo association fee was very cheap for this area, so I considered that a plus. I closed on the sale and I moved in without any problems. The total number of units in the complex is about 130, so it's a decent size. Some have like two bedrooms, some three, and only a few, like mine, have garages with exterior balconies on them. When I moved in, I was presented with a list of the association's bylaws for the property. Nothing major, most were what you'd expect, like keeping your entryway clean, dogs on leashes, guest parking, and such. There was a one pet limit that I could see everyone was ignoring, so I saw that they were a bit lenient with the rules. I became friends with a neighbor and she told me that the association was slow to handle problems. <laughs> in fact, most of the units, conjoined in groups of six or more, were in dire need of new paint. Almost every unit had problems with their windows, but the association was only replacing windows on the backs of the units and only a handful at a time. The association's communication was pretty poor. We'd get infrequent newsletters, but they had an underlying tone of, we'll get to your issues when we can, no sooner than we feel like. They would also announce condo association board elections, but there seemed to be little interest, so they would appoint other owners to the board as needed. About two years in, I got a printed newsletter from an owner in the complex, who we'll call Mike claiming the board is ignoring the owners. It detailed a few things that weren't being addressed, like the paint in the windows, and the owner protests were being ignored. The board wasn't even holding annual open user meetings, which are specified in the association bylaws. Those meetings were also for holding elections of new board members. The letter demanded a change in the situation. Enter Karen. Not her actual name, but it rhymes with Karen. She was the association's treasurer on the board. She was controlling the board, and her word was apparently, quote, law, unquote. That newsletter specifically called for her to step down. Next thing we know, there's an official association newsletter mailed to us that calls the owner's newsletter a complete fabrication and claimed Mike had ulterior motives. There was nothing to address the problems that Mike mentioned. It was just a generalized attack on him. Mike was initially asking for access to the association's books and the association refused to show them to him. This is guaranteed in the association's bylaws. We received another newsletter detailing this and how he was going to take them to court if he was continually blocked. Another response from the association was mailed, but it was just attacking Mike and questioning his motives. I was visited by another neighbor who was circulating a petition demanding change, and I gladly signed it. Nothing was being done, aside from standard groundskeeping and the occasional emergency repair. We received a few more newsletters from Mike and several rebuttals from the association. Mike successfully sued to have access to the books. <laughs> And from the newsletters, he reported that what he saw was just a list of code numbers, not names and dollar amounts for payouts. There was no way to really know who was receiving the money or why. Somewhere in all of these newsletters, it was revealed that Karen, who was an accountant, was being paid by the association for her time. Oh, well, she's an accountant. Mike's newsletters also revealed that Karen chose the maintenance company, which was managed by Marin, Karen's sister. <laughs> wow, what a surprise. Not. The situation was getting worse. Tensions were high. Somewhere in here, the association mailed out a newsletter that claimed all the rebuttals they were mailing out were costing them a lot of money. More like $50, if you consider the postage and it had to stop. 
Also, they announced that they were accepting candidates for the new election, and the form had to be mailed back in by a certain date. It was a step in the right direction, but I soon realized that we received the newsletter on a Saturday, and the deadline for submitting was the following Tuesday. Karen could easily claim that no one had sent in their forms by the deadline. Other owners told me that she'd been doing this trick for years so she could appoint anyone that she wanted to the board. The association was using a P.O. box and the only way to get an application in on time was to go to the post office where the box was on Monday and send a certified letter to prove that it was received in time. <laughs> Fat chance. Mike and his friends had hand delivered those newsletters. One time, I saw someone walking around the complex delivering the newsletter. I went down to retrieve it from my mailbox right away, but I also noticed that Karen was going to every mailbox, pulling these newsletters out and was throwing them into the garbage as she went. I heard her say something like, it wasn't legally mailed. After that event, Mike sued to force a proper election and the judge ordered it. For the election, we had to have a two-third owner majority present, either by attendance or by signed proxy. On the day of the election, many of us arrived at the meeting, and we noticed a security guard was standing by Karen, who was checking everyone in and giving them a ballot. She was expecting trouble. I heard her tell people they couldn't vote because they were in arrears with their monthly dues, had outstanding fines, or were told they weren't the official owner of record. She disqualified many people. Now, there were some arguments, but the security guard kept things civil. Note that our bylaws don't say anything, anything about who can and can't vote aside from the owner on record. On top of that, only a couple of candidates made it onto the ballot, excluding Mike and several others who had definitely applied. The meeting started with Karen giving some general information, and the members were talking amongst themselves a lot. Many were PO'd about being refused a ballot, and others were complaining about all the candidates missing from the ballot. One of the last bits of information was that Karen announced that she would refuse any future letters sent by certified mail because it required someone to go to the post office and acknowledge delivery on a certain date. She would normally get the mail whenever she felt like it. Karen was trying to circumvent the law by conveniently ignoring timely letters like candidate applications and our monthly dues. Some owners brought up the possibility of re-entering Mike and the other candidates onto the ballot as write-ins, and the crowd voted with him, but the board refused to recognize the vote. Lastly, the votes were collected and counted, but the board president announced that they didn't have a two-thirds majority, so the election would be canceled. We were only short a few people. The number of people Karen didn't give ballots to would have tipped the ballots. Surprise! The board quickly adjourned the meeting and left before people realized what was happening. That was a fun night. No one was happy. Mike was paying out of his own pocket for his lawyer and it was getting expensive. I heard the number $20,000 mentioned. People did help defray the cost by donating to the cause though. Mike was not done. He went back to court another time to sue for a legal election. There was nothing in the bylaws that denied voting rights for past due balances and Karen lied about at least one owner not being the owner of record. Armed with that information, the judge ordered another election to be supervised by an independent third party lawyer. As I recall, the association's lawyer quit because they kept going against his advice. They replaced him with a yes man. The third party lawyer was in complete charge of the election, including collecting candidate applications. A reasonable deadline for applications was set, two weeks, and proxy ballots were sent out as well. Karen's position was up for election, as were two other positions. We found out that the board president was appointed by Karen, but he was not an owner and had to step down. 
only owners can serve on the board. Finally, the election came and pretty much everyone showed up or had provided proxy votes. <laughs> there was definitely a two-thirds majority present, not including proxy votes. The lawyer called for three volunteers from the owners to count the ballots. The results were that four new people joined the board that night. They had gotten around 80 to 90 votes each. Another active board member got 17 votes and Karen got 15 or something like that. We presume her votes were all proxy votes. I was wondering if they were going to go after Karen for getting paid and cooking the books, but the new treasurer received everything with proper records, names this time and not numbers. The maintenance company was tossed out almost immediately. Karen sold her unit and moved to Florida, but not before arranging for some exterior beautification around her unit, complete with plant boxes, flowers, and shrubs. We think she saw the writing on the wall and moved out before any backlash could occur. The association's lawyer was also replaced. Then came the bad news. The association had to pay out almost $50,000 in legal fees to fight against Mike and his lawsuits. Since the association was paying for the lawyer, we couldn't put the bill on Karen. What a pity! We later discovered that the long-term project fund, used for major upkeep of the complex, was pretty badly depleted and needed to be refilled. Our lawyer advised us that for the size of the complex, it needed to be over $2 million, but there was less than $1 million in the fund. Fortunately, they didn't demand assessments, but instead raised the monthly dues to start making up the difference. In the 15 years I've been here, the dues went from $150 to $375 and go up annually now. Karen had ignored many of the longer term projects and in the next two to three years, the buildings were repainted, the roofs were reshingled, bad windows were replaced, and all the balconies were completely rebuilt. In more recent years, our insurance company demanded we repave the roadway because it was falling apart in places. They wouldn't insure it unless that was done immediately. These days, we have a better and more responsive maintenance company and a Facebook page for general announcements and chit chat. There are no real winners in this case, but after all of the required improvements were done, most of us feel better living here than during the dark time of Karen's reign. My HOA are incompetent scum. My father stalks them until they resign. Takedown posted by a Juriac Hermit. So I live in a relatively new suburban neighborhood with a homeowners association, an HOA, that has been slowly getting more annoying. My father, a paranoid, vengeful Republican retired civil engineer, is the main disperser of the revenge. Here's a list of their earlier offenses. About five years ago, they sent us a notice to move our garbage bins out of the street, and if they were left outside of the backyard after garbage day for too long again, they would fine us. Our garbage bins were not in the street. We were also very good about putting our garbage bins away promptly after they sent us a warning after we left them out during a week-long vacation. They somehow mixed up our house with our neighbors. My dad spray painted our lot number on the bins so that this wouldn't happen again. The rest of the neighborhood slowly followed suit. From what I hear, the security guard the HOA hired is also paid to look for infractions on each lot, but apparently is not paid enough to get the lot numbers right, so this happened several times. The light on our address number hasn't worked since the house was built and we bought immediately after it was finished because the construction job was rather shoddy. Six years later, somebody from the HOA finally noticed and told us that we had to pay to fix it even though it was due to an electrical fault on the part of the builders. They also demanded a picture to prove that we fixed it. My father opened the box where the light was, put a glow stick in, and took a picture at night and then sent it in, the address light seemingly fixed. They bought it. They even tried to force all members of the neighborhood into this poorly designed social network for our neighborhood. Nobody liked it, and the network was barely even used by the HOA. 
not announcing HOA meetings except a day or two before the meeting by posting the times on the dilapidated board at the park at the center of the neighborhood. The paper often falls off and blows away, so the meetings were not often attended by anybody until recently because of the big offense that follows. Here's the big one that set my dad off. There is apparently a clause in the HOA guidelines that, every so often, we must have the house repainted. The first time to do this came up last year. There was a lot of crappy bureaucracy involved, like having to submit a request to do the mandated painting. And then the whole neighborhood was mandated to use these expensive, not particularly good paints that couldn't be bought anywhere nearby except from a posh overpriced supplier some 100 miles away. My father, being a cheapskate, said screw that and he got a small time guy, real friendly, to do the job on the cheap and use paints that were one tone off but were more durable and cheaper because they could be bought in bulk from the big store down the street. He does a great job in just two hot summer days, doing all the work with just him and, I believe, two others, all on the cheap. A few months later, when everybody else was repainting their houses, we get a notice that our house is not painted according to code and submit a new request to repaint our house or face penalties. My dad was steaming because he was pretty sure the only reason they required us to use those colors was because the paint company was paying them to and the house looked great. He endured months of poorly managed bureaucracy. He kept sending the request to repaint the house and they kept playing around, losing the request, not keeping him notified of the matter, delaying the processing until it neared the deadline to paint the house. If we overshot the deadline, we would be fined. He demanded that they just fine him, uh, bribe, for using the wrong paint and not force him to repaint with the overpriced crappy paint. They wanted to make an example of us and have him come before a disciplinary committee and my father wouldn't let this stand. While they kept playing bureaucratic games, my father started his revenge games. He got somebody in the HOA to tell him where the offices of their management was and he went there to demand to speak with them, to complain, and ask for information on the proceedings. Because it was so far out of the way and hard to figure out where it was, and he made such a fuss, they panicked. He went again a week later and they had beefed up security and denied him entry unless he had an appointment. When he met with the disciplinary committee, there was an armed security guard there. My father pulled out all of his know-how as a civil engineer and told them that the paint they were using was subpar, overpriced, and it was clear that they had no experience in the field and needed a consultant. They politely declined his services and tried to get him to pin all the blame on the painter, which he refused to do as he authorized the painter to cheap out on the paint. As punishment, they force us to repaint in a different, much uglier color that's completely out of place for the neighborhood and was apparently designed for a completely different location. We give in, but my father won't let this go without them knowing never to screw with him again. He starts calling and emailing them regularly to demand to know when the next HOA meeting is and berate them for not properly notifying the neighborhood by email or even regular mail and newsletters. Pretty sure this is a violation of their regulations, but they might be just barely fulfilling them with the half-butt posting the day before the meetings mentioned earlier. He then starts attending every meeting and recording them. I join him and I pretend to be unrelated to make it appear that more people were upset with them. Turns out they've been ticking people off all over the neighborhood, including refusing to let a family dispose of a diseased tree ruining their lot. I don't recall all the details, but I think the tree wasn't actually on their property, but rather an empty lot or a condemned lot next door, but it was damaging their garden and property. Doing nothing to deal with a hornet nest on a block set of mailboxes. The mailboxes are all set up in one conjoined block of boxes that was causing the mail person to refuse to deliver the mail there, causing people to miss bills and important mail. Forcing at least two other houses who did the same as us to repaint in those crappy colors. My dad met with these people and he gathered their contact info. We had planned to organize with other angry neighbors to stage a coup once elections came around. 
After the first meeting, my father took the information he'd gathered on the people in charge of the HOA, took to the internet, and found much more. The second meeting he goes to, he shows with name placards for all of them, so that the neighborhood could know not only their names and positions, they couldn't be bothered to do this themselves, but also their addresses and phone numbers, letting them know he knows who they are and where they live. This, on top of his harassment by email and phone and their office, to the point that they had hired security guards to protect them from an angry old gun-owning man, must have been too much for this group of 30-something soccer moms. The next meeting, there's new HOA people. The president, vice president, and half the board have resigned. Turns out, they were all a clique that used the HOA as more of a social club than a serious thing. My father is satisfied, and the new board starts taking action to actually help people in the neighborhood. Commenter says, your dad should start a business called HOA Busters, where he goes to a neighborhood that's being terrorized and gets them to resign or vote out. He could also have people filming him. I would watch that show. My HOA Experience, posted by Lil Bit Evil. I'm a 41-year-old male. At an experienced age of 25 years and a bachelor, I grew tired of living in a low-rent apartment surrounded by less than lawful individuals and decided that a mortgage at the time would be only a little more per month and would make a great investment. Oh, to go back in time and give myself a talk because what I learned was that living in an HOA only makes you a glorified renter. At the end of the day, you own nothing. The condo I purchased was very nice. 1,300 square foot, three bedroom, two bath, vaulted ceilings, thick walls. <laughs> I was pretty impressed with myself. Unfortunately, the HOA <laughs> was not well managed. The board was nothing more than puppets for the management company who might as well have been the landlord. It was a large HOA, 26 buildings with 12 units each. I learned in comparison to friends that this was a good thing as it meant assessment fees were more spread out. When I moved in, I didn't know about assessment fees and I was barely educated on the HOA fee. One of the selling points was the low HOA fee, only $80 a month. <laughs> But later, I found out that the developer, who was still finishing the last four buildings, supplemented the fee to keep it low so he could sell more units. I also didn't know that my HOA was a sub-HOA, which means that it was an HOA inside of an HOA. So I had to pay the master HOA another 25 bucks a month to do nothing at all, literally nothing but the privilege of living in an HOA that was part of a collection of other HOAs. The sub-HOAs did all the internal maintenance, and the city itself took care of the HOA communal areas like the public roads. Meanwhile, my sub-HOA board was full of out-of-state South Californians in a snow-heavy state. My first year there, they budgeted $2,000 for snow removal and $45,000 for beautification, which was like new wood chips and remodeling the clubhouse. <laughs> Meanwhile, the snow removal fee came to $35,000. At the HOA meeting to vote on how to pay this $35,000 snow fee, they banned anyone from talking about how we got into that mess and how anyone who did it was arrested for disorderly conduct by the police standing by on request of the management company. Eventually, they voted on an assessment fee which came to about $350-ish for each unit. Later I learned the plow company was owned by the management company owner's relative. That plow guy came out if there was barely a visible frost on the ground and charged us $100 per push every time he backed up and drove forward. Eventually the HOA board was replaced and they replaced the management company with a new company. The new company liked to play with the pool keys and charge you to turn them back on. They always tried to claim your card was read at the pool during an unauthorized time, or, or that that card that you were using was a fake that they didn't issue. The 2008 recession hit without selling the last of the units. The developer backed out of supplementing the fees and the fee jumped $65 and then $10 the next year. Probably even higher later, but I moved out.
the developer screwed up and didn't have room to give the last building or so their two parking spots which one was covered. So now the HOA wanted to revoke everyone's second spot. Problem, the second spot was on my mortgage and bylaws provided for a second spot. The HOA dropped the revoked spot idea, but I do not know how they eventually solved it. Last, I overpaid my HOA every month for dues, placing me several hundred over as insurance against the next assessment fee. So I paid a little amount for the HOA to install a screen on my dryer vent to keep the birds out against my credit. I also paid for several upgrades inside to sell the place. Unfortunately, when I tried to sell, the recession was at its worst and I sold at a loss to get out of there and buy a house. The last insult of this HOA was to claim that I never paid for the screen on my dryer vent and that I owed a few hundred in back HOA fees. If I didn't pay, they would place a lien on me, which would mess with the condo I sold and the house I was buying. <sighs> so I, I paid the ransom and I walked away from that dumpster fire. The good news is the house I bought was no HOA and has tripled in value. I do know the master HOA was eventually sued by all the sub HOAs and dissolved because they did nothing but rent an office down the street. I've also ran into people who still own in my old sub HOA <laughs> and yes, the fee is now much higher. Shady HOA dealings exposed in non-existent HOA by the raccoon to and it has an update. So I bought my house four and a half years ago from the company that built it. The house I bought was new construction in a neighborhood that had existed for about eight years. Even now, there are still a few empty lots in the neighborhood. Last year, I received a document in my mailbox, which confused me as it was a handful of pages stapled together. The title on the first page was, Restrictive Covenants for Our Neighborhood. After reading through the documents, I was confused as it was supposedly the covenants for the homeowners association that governed our neighborhood. I immediately contacted the builder of my home asking about an HOA. He had his realtor call me and she assured me that there was no HOA. And looking at the online website for our county, there is no organization registered with the name of our neighborhood, which would be required of an HOA. So I also talked to one of my neighbors, whose house had also been built by the same builder, and asked if he had found a copy in his mailbox. He had, and I explained that I would talked to the builder and his realtor and that there was no HOA. He was relieved, as his wife was really angry about thinking that they'd been duped into buying a house in an HOA neighborhood. While we were standing in his front yard talking, another neighbor walked up and he also said that he'd received a copy and he knew the person who was distributing them. She was really upset that commercial vehicles were being allowed to park overnight in our neighborhood. There are a couple of work trucks that park in the driveways of a few of our neighbors at night. One of the key things to note is that the document was not mailed to me. Somebody made the copies and then put a copy in my mailbox. No envelope and no postage. I live in the USA and accessing someone else's mailbox is a crime. So I took the document to a copy store and I had them make me a couple of copies without removing the original staple from the corner. I then took the original to the local USPS post office, I showed them the document, and they explained how it came into my possession. The clerk behind the counter said I would need to talk to the postmaster, and when he came to the counter, I showed him the document, and I explained about it appearing in my mailbox. He was scowling by the time I finished, and I pointed out the last page, which was a letter complaining about all the people that were violating the number 8 of the covenants, which was a prohibition of parking commercial vehicles on the roads or driveways in the neighborhood, stating that all commercial vehicles must be parked in a closed garage. So the letter also asked for our support in electing the person who had distributed the copies to the HOA board. It contained the name, the address, and the phone number of the person. The postmaster saw that last page, broke out into a really evil grin, and asked if he could have the document. 
I told him that the document he was looking at was the original that I'd found in my mailbox and that I had copies for my own files without removing the staple. I also told him that I'd spoken to several of my neighbors and they had also received copies in their mailboxes. The postmaster thanked me and said that he would be calling the person and explaining to them how many federal laws they'd violated by accessing someone else's mailbox. So my neighbors and I, we are still HOA free. An update. Now another thing to consider is that an HOA is a business and legally has to file certain reports every year to document fees collected and expenses paid and have a certain number of meetings every year with notifications publicly posted of the meeting dates, the times, and the locations and hold elections for members of the board, which also requires notifications to be publicly posted. At least that's true in Tennessee where I live. There are stone walls with signs at the entry to the neighborhood. As an example, if the sign says Charles Place, the road I lived on would have been named Charles Road, and the crazy neighbor would then think that there's a Charles Place HOA. The Tennessee Secretary of State's office has a business information search page on their website, and when I search for the first word in the name of our community, it comes up with three entries, all of which are a construction company with slightly different names like Charles Construction Incorporated, LLC, and then incorporated with capital letters, with different ending dates. The two that are inactive show the same city as where I live, but the active entry is in a different city about 300 miles away. There are two words on the signs at the entrance to the community, and if I search for both words, there are no records found. Also, in the four and a half years that I've lived here, I've never been asked to pay any HOA dues or fees, nor have I ever received notification of an HOA meeting or HOA election. Based on what was in the letter, my neighbor started this whole mess in order to ban all commercial vehicles from parking on the street or in driveways. In order to start an HOA, a vote has to be taken of all the property owners within the proposed boundaries of the HOA, with a simple majority required. But one of the nice things is that regardless of how the vote goes, an existing property owner can still choose to not join the new HOA and would not be subject to fees or fines or any new rules created by the new HOA. But once the non-member sells their property, then the new buyer would be required to join the HOA. Terrible HOA Karen in neighbor who is also on the HOA board is nitpicking on us and threatens to call the police. What do we do? Posted by QS Muta. I recently bought a condo, a second floor unit, and have been trying to settle in with my family, two kids, 12 year old and three year old. My problem is our 65 plus old neighbor who's also on the board of the HOA. She lives alone with her dog right next door to us. She's been kind of bullying us from day one. Every time she passes by us, she gives this disapproving and demeaning look, which I never understood why. Our downstairs neighbor who came in and introduced themselves told us that she is like that to everyone and warned us to stay away from her. She has been telling us to do a lot of things, like park our car much too far away from the parking line even though we parked ours much well inside the lines because she wants more space to open her car doors. We agreed because we wanted to be nice. She keeps telling our kid not to play in the front of the building. This is a gated community and all kids play out in front in the evenings. We agreed. She then said that he should not play behind the building also, which is mostly woods and trees. We agreed to that too. But our 12 year old being 12 years old went some 30 feet into the tree area and sat underneath the trees with his two friends and was playing with sticks. This woman comes knocking our door and yells at me. I said, okay, I will tell my child to not play there. But I got real ticked off when she said, when does school start? Very soon, I suppose. Can't wait for them to go back in front of my kid. He felt very hurt and I convinced him, saying that sometimes people can be mean and we should not be bothered by it. Last week at around 1130 at night, my husband was sitting in our balcony spray painting a picture frame. She came downstairs to walk her dog, looked up, saw us and asked what we were doing. My husband said, spray painting. She gave some weird BS reasons as to why we're not allowed to spray paint or switch on our balcony light after 10 p.m. and that there are rules. She also had the management email us the rule book. We read through it and there was nothing relating to balcony lights or spray painting or anything remotely related to it. Yesterday, I was spray painting a footboard in the evening and I finished doing it at around 10.30 at night. 
She saw me cleaning up and then asked, are you painting again? I said, yeah. She replied, I have told you already not to do that. It's 1030. I politely and very calmly said, hey, I'm only spray painting and it is not disturbing anyone. To which she angrily replied, there are rules and I'm complaining about you to the police tomorrow and walked away. I brought in the headboard 30 minutes later after they dried. She does not live directly above or below us and there's no way she would even know that I was painting if she hadn't looked up into my balcony. There was absolutely no noise except from the very small spraying noise from the rattle can, which I am 200% sure is not audible 10 feet away from where I was painting. We did not make a peep when moving the headboard also. We feel like we're being bossed around by this woman. A few others feel this way too, but they've not openly said it to us, but have implied it. She has lived in this building for over 25 years and we are only two months in. We are Asians and immigrants. Any police complaints against us could affect our visa status. At the same time, I don't want to be walking over eggshells in my own home. I would like to live with self-respect. We just bought this place and moving is not an option. What do I do? This commenter lays down the truth. It's time for you to read, know, and understand every rule in the HOA like the back of your hand. This way, she has no power over you. She assumes that you will comply because she thinks that she knows more. Use the rules to your advantage and don't give her the satisfaction of you breaking even the most minor of rules. Vindictive ex-wife illegally signed application to the local HOA in my name. Posted by Spurred one last time. I'll start this off by saying my ex is vindictive as heck. We've been fully divorced since about right before the pandemic started. We sold the house we shared and I didn't have to pay her alimony because she cheated and we're in an at-fault state. It was as messy since D-Day. All of the stereotypes. First, the sobbing and then the trickle truth saying, I love you. It was just one time. Okay, it was two years. And then the gaslighting followed by, I'm going to take you for everything before packing her crap and walking out. I feel like I never really knew the woman my ex was in all the time we were together. We were married five years and together for seven. And in two of those five married years, she had affairs with three other men. The final one being a foreign businessman out of some sort from what I could figure out. Yes, I got tested for STDs and was thankfully negative. Yes, she got pregnant by the final affair partner, and no, I didn't sign the birth certificate because I found out about all the affairs before the baby was born, thanks to a call from the first affair partner. My ex tried to go full scorched earth on me. But since we live in and were married in an at-fault state, she lost. We didn't pay equally into our house, and the equity was divided 70-30. So I got a pretty good cash payout when I sold our marital home to put as a down payment on a different house closer to my job. It's a bit of a downgrade, but suits a single guy in his 30s like me just fine. My ex did show up to my house once, but I refused to let her in. She barked and complained at me that I'd financially ruined her in the divorce. I said that if she was fully willing to do that to me first, and the witch had the audacity to say it should have been my life screwed over and not hers. I laughed so hard and said it was karma. She yelled that she'd sue me for what was rightfully hers. I said if she was going to sue me, then to go ahead and sue me. It ended up the same way in court because she had nothing but a false sob story. She was the cheater, not me. I'm no angel, but I didn't do anything to her. And then she was the one who ruined our marriage. She then said that she'd tell everyone she could that I abused her. And I said that I'd sue her for defamation if she did. And I was recording our interaction and had those words saved to my phone. She went wide-eyed and her jaw dropped. The look people are calling the surprised Pikachu face was this. Then I asked why she was there, if not to just try and make trouble, because she had a new man in her life that knocked her up. She just huffed at me and said he isn't around much, and she's stuck in a tiny apartment living off his child support till he comes back. It was immature of me, I know, but I did the bit of playing the world's smallest violin. 
She yelled at me to go screw myself, and then I yelled back that I'd sooner do that than her any time. She raged at me, and then got in her car to leave. I haven't seen her since. There's an HOA in my neighborhood, but I was not legally obligated to join it because the last owner of my house was not a member. I made sure of that through a real estate lawyer as well. The HOA had no grounds to force me to join, and they were not happy about it. The HOA president would show up with forms every week for the first month demanding that I sign them. Then she threatened to take me to court, to which I had to get a cease and desist sent to her from my lawyer to make her stop that. So she started harassing me by looking for any infractions that she possibly could to report me to the city. An inspector came out several times and found nothing wrong. In fact, I offered one of them a burger while grilling, and they graciously accepted. Did I mention the HOA hates barbecues and parties that aren't approved in advance? Well, they do. And I like to grill when the weather's good. And my neighbors actually love me for it because I invite them over. I had the police called on me several times for noise complaints because I was playing music on a Saturday afternoon while having my friends over. The HOA president I caught trespassing once when she was trying to peer into my windows. I called the police, but she denied ever doing it. So I got cameras. She hasn't trespassed since. But I still got repeative passive-aggressive letters saying that my cameras were not an approved addition to my house. Some months ago, I started getting letters for fines in the mail. And when I contacted the HOA, their representative claimed that they had it on record that I joined and needed to pay all the fees effective immediately. I told them that that was not possible. And then they emailed a scanned copy of the forms and they had a signature on them. But it was not mine. It was very similar in some ways and I recognized right away as being my ex's handwriting. She knew what my signature looked like, but it was a loose imitation at best. I got in touch with the lawyer right away over the forged signature, but the HOA still demanded to go to court, and it took seven months before that happened. Meanwhile, they were stacking unpaid fines against me weekly, and they were threatening to put a lien on my house. We went to court and the HOA president looked very smug, but my lawyer pointed out how the signature wasn't the same as mine and was very inconsistent in the various forms. I never allowed the HOA president in my house and I never requested the forms. The idiot HOA president actually slammed her palm on the table and said it was still binding. But when pressed where the fraudulent signature came from, she admitted my ex-wife called the HOA and they sent her the forms, then got them back in the mail signed. But then she actually claimed she thought that I'd sign them. The judge looked at her and asked if she was serious, and she confirmed she was. The judge then asked how a woman I was no longer married to that had never even lived with me in my current residence was supposed to have any bearing on whether or not I joined her HOA. She went quiet, and I could see the oh crap look on her face as the hamster wheels were turning and she seemed to finally mentally put the pieces together. My lawyer then counterclaimed that what the HOA did was blatant fraud and legal actions must be taken, and they were. I countersued the HOA for the emotional distress of the harassment I've gotten since moving in, which I had lots of proof of. That won me about 10 grand after lawyer fees that I decided to put toward my mortgage. The HOA president was removed from her throne. I like to think she was kicking and screaming. She was also slapped with a hefty fine. I've seen her outside a few times and she always looks at me like I'm the devil. The HOA itself had to pay all of my legal fees too. I wanted to go after my ex for forging my signature, but I can't because not long after she forged my signature on those forms, she apparently left the country to be with her third affair partner. She's uh, somewhere in Europe from what I can see of the final post on her Facebook before she disappeared. 
so I can't do anything against her unless she ever returns to the US. So that was a wash. I'm not getting letters from the HOA anymore though, and the new president has promised to keep things completely cordial from now on. I still don't feel like I got much of a win in this though. Other than the $10,000 payout, it all felt like a huge waste of time. Interesting comments here. Deleted says, statute of limitations, even if nothing happens because she's out of the country, get a default judgment since she will not show up to court. That may even block her from re-entry. And Crazy Supervisor says, it won't block her from re-entry, but she will be detained in customs. It will likely force her return as well because she won't be able to renew any visas because countries tend to not want each other's criminals and problems. Gotta love HOAs. Posted by Dragon Rider 1964. My great-grandfather purchased about 3,000 acres of land in Florida in the late 1800s. This land has been in the family ever since, and there's been a family home on the property throughout. Land is zoned as agricultural, and we've raised livestock and farmed various items over the years. Ownership of the land has been passed down over the years, with the oldest getting the house. My father passed in 2000 and left the house to me, now my mom still lives in the house, and the land was split between three siblings equally, about a thousand acres each. My brother, who lives in California, and sister, living in Texas, quickly sold their lots to a property development company, about the same that I had purchased a neighboring lot, 850 acres, as my own. The development company quickly purchased a lot of land and began building family units, which are three, four, and five bedroom homes. This company repeatedly made attempts to get me to sell the 1,850 acres that I owned. They fought the county to get land rezoned so that I could not use it as a farm. That failed since I was actively using it and land became zoned as agricultural slash residential. In 2015, the development company completed the project and transferred control of the community to an HOA which was registered in 2016. The meat and potatoes. As soon as the HOA became officially recognized by the county, the board pushed to force me and my family to join. <laughs> nope, that is not happening. We have received visits from HOA board members explaining how we are in violation of the rules and how we must pay fines they have imposed. Fines have included livestock and farm animals not allowed, farm equipment left visible, unauthorized structures on site, and we have two barns, three storage sheds, a detached three-car garage, and four covered feed stations for animals. They also said cars and vehicles not parked in a garage was a fine. The driveway was not properly maintained, unapproved fencing, the house painted the wrong collar. They went to house trim, collar not approved, front door style and collar not approved, trees unapproved, lawn unsightly. They kept going and going with mailbox not correct style, mailbox not within community height standards. Fines started at $50 up to $1,500 and incurred massive late fees. And the biggest was failure to sign the HOA membership form. Now, I am an attorney, however, I'm not versed in property law, so I hired someone who is. And she has been having fun. Cease and desist orders at least once a year. Several trespass orders against board members and the HOA itself. At least three court cases to get fines and property liens removed. As you can imagine, this has been trying. In January 2019, I filed plans and was approved to build a six-foot concrete and stucco wall running the length of my property. This wall will be five feet onto my side of the property line and will be maintained by me. The plans were on file and the HOA had time to contest them. In October 2019, work began. The side of the wall was leveled and this brought about the HOA to file numerous complaints for noise and unapproved improvements. Several times, the HOA made attempts to have equipment towed or removed even though it was parked on my property. In February 2020, the wall was completed which included lighting and security cameras and a large decorative iron gate at my main driveway. I also had a new driveway installed. Figured that a nice, clean, well-maintained wall would make the HOA happy. Haha, <laughs> nope! 
I did not mow the five feet of grass along the gate as well as the HOA would like. I also did not bag the grass clippings. The wall was the wrong color, and my wife chose sand as it was a neutral color, and the wall was too high. HOA laws are four feet max. Since the issue with the virus, this HOA has had way too much time. They started by repainting my wall and sending me the bill. They started removing and disabling my lights and security cameras and sending me the bill. And, and they have a company that dug up and resodded the five foot strip of grass to the HOA requirements and sent me the bill, which includes a year of maintenance. My attorney nearly laughed herself into a coma. The outcome. It did not take long. The HOA, its board of directors, and the companies they hired were all ordered to appear in court. After hearing all sides and seeing all documentation, the judge ruled. The company that painted the wall has 30 days to repaint it the color that it was. The company that disabled and removed the lights and security cameras have 30 days to return them to working order and the grass is allowed to remain. The HOA was ordered to absorb all costs. This includes the work they ordered and all the work needed to return my property to the way I had it. Further, the judge ordered that the HOA, from now until eternity, is to have no contact with me or my family. Now, I am going to request a permit to build a rifle range on my property. HOA is pulling some seriously strange and seemingly nefarious stunts. Can you guys give me any insights? Post to buy real estate toss. I'm a first time home buyer running into some seriously weird issues with an HOA and curious about the legality of some of the stunts that they're pulling. I'm a veteran using the VA loan. Nothing is closed yet, but things are getting close enough to start worrying. Sorry for the long post, but there's a lot to question. My partner and I are purchasing a condo unit in Chicago. We've already agreed to a price with the seller, and our lender has approved the loan. The appraisal and the inspection are both completed as well. When it came time to drop off some money orders to the front office, we started seeing some serious problems. The building manager was great, up until we handed her the sales contract and the number for money down was still blank. Our lender told us to leave this blank for the time being just so VA loan stuff could clear and it didn't need to be there until way closer to closing anyway. Here's where the fun starts. The building manager asked what our loan to value was rather quickly and we were stumped because as newbies we aren't great with a lot of terms. We told her we were doing a VA loan and she immediately snaps back with Oh, so do you have the 20 months of assessment fees available to pay? We had absolutely no idea what she was talking about and let her know that. She prints off page 22 and 23 of their 40 page HOA rule book and shows us a clause buried in there where if you put down 0%, you owe 20 months of assessment fees. She did some quick math to show that we would end up owing just shy of what a 10% down payment would look like. She also included two parking spots and cable and internet. The parking spots are on a wait list and we were like eight spots down so she pulled those numbers right out of thin air and the cable and internet it's already on the assessment fee and she listed it again so i'm feeling like it's uh, pretty obvious that she's trying to just scare us off it doesn't end there she's also requesting that we each file a credit report through a company that they use Again, after we've already been through this with our lender and bank and received credit scores from Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. I asked if they could just get this from our lender since it's, well, already been done. And I was given a stern no, that it has to be through this specific company. They gave us a number, an extension, and asked for this name. For what it's worth, both of our credit scores, well, they're very good. Certainly more than sufficient for this place. They've also requested that the next HOA board meeting they have, that we meet them remotely so they can basically interview us and it sounds like they're going to approve us moving in. The 20 months of assessment payments were provided in the HOA rulebook that they gave us, but we didn't receive it at the beginning when we were discussing with the seller. It was also buried in an email with a total of 63 PDFs, only one of which was the rulebook. Everything else was just cover pages, meeting minutes, small potatoes, and nothing pages. 
No one except the HOA was aware of this 20-month assessment fee. Not us, not our realtor, our lawyer, lender, the seller, the seller's broker, the seller's lawyer. Nobody had a clue until we told them the building manager hit us with it and everyone's arguing that this fee should have been front and center. Also, none of us, seller's side included, have ever heard of such a clause and we're all in agreement that it sounds absolutely insane. Our lender told us to just basically tell them to kick rocks on having our credit hit again for their report as this is a pretty bad thing to do during a major purchase. If they want credit scores, they can get them from him if he even deems it necessary. Our realtor suspects that voting in people in the building sounds like something that a co-op does and doubts this is even legal. Our lawyer is looking into how they got around this being a form of discrimination. So I'm wondering, has anyone seen anything like this? How can we even hack this apart? Is this stuff even legal? Even if we beat these fees, what are the odds that the HOA just messes with us the entire time we're there? It isn't too late to back out and cut our losses, but it's getting way too close to let it go. These comments are perfect. Imagine if you bought this place and then needed to sell it in a tight market. Would you want these people scaring away your potential buyers? If I was a condo owner, I'd be ticked. Honestly, if you can walk away from this BS, you should. They are letting you know up front that they are going to be difficult at best to deal with and there's no parking. Walk away. When Evil Mama Bear Tried to Restart the HOA Hosted by Craig L. Tom now the neighborhood my mother's house is in had an HOA that was disbanded in the early 90s for the uh, pretty stereotypical reasons. Corrupt leaders, misappropriation of funds, and so on. I really don't have many details on it since I was very little when it went down. But my mother had apparently been openly aiming for a seat on the HOA council for years. So she was really sore when the HOA was gone because she could no longer run for a position. Fast forward to 1999. Evil Mama Bear had been trying to quote the old HOA covenants to the neighborhood for years and insisted that the rules and regulations set forth when the HOA was active should still be abided by. Literally no one wanted to listen to her. So my mother started putting flyers around the neighborhood that detailed that she was restarting the HOA without their approval and would be its first new president. The neighbors ended up in an uproar over this and showed up to her public meeting. And there, she was verbally ripped to shreds as nearly every single homeowner in the neighborhood not only denied their support of another HOA, but also made it clear to her what she was trying to do was not legal. My mother was incensed by this. And no surprise, she didn't even have my father's support, which was something that she'd initially been counting on but he refused from the onset of her scheme. And when the neighborhood all refused to recreate the HOA, evil mama bear went off on my dad for not being supportive of her. After she gaslighted herself into nearly being out of breath, my dad told her she was just looking for a way to lord over the neighborhood and he'd never support that. She tried to argue with him some more, but he just ended the conversation and walked away. Somehow, that still didn't stop my mother though. She went and contacted a sleazy lawyer about trying to get the HOA running again without the support of the residents. Her hope was that there was some sort of law that could reactivate the HOA on different grounds. The lawyer went through all of the old HOA documents and state laws over a couple of days and told my mother there was nothing that could be done as it was not enforceable and that Without the consent and signed support of enough people in the neighborhood, there was no way to legally restart the HOA. Then proceeded to bill evil mama bear for the time he spent looking through all of that. Since my mother hired the sleazy lawyer herself under the table, she had to pay him. But she hated paying anyone for anything because she was so cheap. Now, an important fact of note was that my dad hadn't trusted Evil Mama Bear with his money for years and no longer kept joint bank accounts with her. And so, she had no way to access his money. So she filed for a new credit card using his name and then used said credit card to pay the lawyer instead. My dad noticed a new credit card statement in his name pretty fast and nearly filed for fraud when my mother came clean out of fear. 
he demanded she pay off the credit card and then have said card deactivated. My mother didn't want to, but he threatened to call the fraud department of his bank on her. I still remember hearing the argument where she tried to claim that he couldn't do that because they were married and that everything that was his was also hers. That meant that she could do what she did and he'd still have to pay. Dad called BS on that and said that he'd contest the charges and get the card removed from his name, which would have left my mother in some serious legal trouble for fraud and debt collection. And so, Evil Mama Bear begrudgingly paid off the money owed, and my dad cut the card to little pieces with scissors. My mother had the money to pay the lawyer all along. She just preferred to keep the cash and put any expenses she could on my father. But he always stopped her, and she tried to pull the shared assets logic because they were married, though that ended when they divorced. Evil Mama Bear still spent the next few years trying to quote the HOA covenants to neighbors, but she was always dismissed or laughed at every single time she tried. A few people started referring to her as President Wannabe. To this day, no HOA has formed in the neighborhood again, and even if one did, they'd never vote in Evil Mama Bear. I can only imagine what would happen if she tried to pull this crap in Texas after she moves there. Now, I've had a few people messaging me that the lawyer I spoke of in the story that my mother went to wasn't sleazy just by association with my mother and just did what normal lawyers do. Well, he was known by reputation to overcharge people. And my own lawyer told me some time ago that he had first-hand experience with the sleazy lawyer because he knew him in person. The guy would intentionally take longer than needed to do anything so he could charge more time from clients. That, among other shady things he did, bit him in the butt some years ago and he shut down his office. Mom takes down the HOA from the inside. Posted by Quiet Fangirl. My neighborhood does not have a homeowners association. <laughs> At least, not anymore. When my parents first moved in, my older sibling, maybe two years old, and with me as a little glowworm, there was an HOA. They took money from the neighborhood in exchange for their services. At first, and for quite a while, my parents just kind of well, shrugged it off. The HOA shoveled the snow off the streets in the winter, and they dealt with trash collection, so they were doing something worthwhile, right? Haha, <laughs> no. The city controlled the snow plows and the garbage trucks, not the HOA. But still, there was the illusion of effort. And besides, one summer, they decided to contact a company to plant new trees all over the neighborhood. The fact that the company was owned by the son of the head of the HOA was totally coincidental. The trees were the beginning of the end for the HOA. Why? Well, my grandmother on my dad's side was visiting when they came around to plant the trees. My grandma, who is a certified master gardener. And so, she stared through the windows of our house as the guys planting the trees just dropped the saplings on the grass. Still with their roots inside the bag that they came in. No holes dug, no holes cut. Just a bagged sapling, lying on the grass like a pathetic, sad little stick. The saplings laid there all night. No one came back to actually do their job and plant them. My master gardener grandma mentioned offhand that those saplings were going to die unless they got in the soil. And something clicked in my mom's head. She was paying the HOA money, actual money, every month while both she and my dad worked, taking care of two very little kids, sending us to daycare and preschool and arranging babysitters and feeding us. And the homeowners association was just going to pull this half-butt bullcrap instead of do what she's paying them for? <laughs> no, no freaking way. So... She showed up to the head of the HOA's house and basically demanded that the trees get planted properly like she's apparently paying for them to do. The head of the HOA, so excited for someone actually caring about the neighborhood, made their second mistake. They asked if mom wanted to join the HOA. She agreed. 
The trees were planted, but most didn't make it. My grandma was right. First things first, my mom showed up to the next HOA meeting. There were like uh, five people there. No wonder they asked mom to join. They desperately needed the people. So mom looked at this collection of white people, herself included, who weren't even paying money to the HOA like the rest of the neighborhood. All the contractors the HOA called in were close relatives of other HOA members and they weren't paid by the HOA. After all, they're family. So my mom started digging. She spent pretty much a full summer taking down the HOA before she had to go back to teaching in the fall. With me carted along after her and my sibling old enough to be in school or daycare, she dug through the years of paperwork detailing the HOA's financial situation. And she found something extremely enlightening. The HOA didn't actually do anything. Well, they didn't do anything to the benefit of the community. Everything they claimed to do was either covered by the individual homeowner or by the city itself. So they were collecting money from all the neighborhood residents under false pretenses. And actually, they weren't even supposed to be in our neighborhood. Their association zone was a whole different neighborhood. So what is a working mother of two small children to do while her husband is off at work and she's off for the summer? She goes door to door with pamphlets. Me and my sibling in a stroller as she weaves her way through the neighborhood blocks, pamphlets explaining the situation and how to stop paying for services you'll never get. Pamphlets that are, of course, written in both English and Spanish to account for the high amount of Latino and Hispanic people in our neighborhood. And naturally, she got a lawyer and an accountant. It put a major dent in her pocket, but if it meant the entire neighborhood wasn't exploited for money each month, it was worth every penny. Another HOA member helped her sift through the documents and the data and pass out pamphlets and encourage people to show up to the meetings, but had to back out because of work-related reasons. My mom rolled up to the courthouse, flanked by the lawyer and the accountant, her kids safe at home with her husband, and had more than enough evidence to get the homeowners association the heck out of her neighborhood, expose the fraudsters for the frauds they were, and make sure that no HOA would ever ever pushed their luck in our neighborhood. It's been almost 19 years and no one's even tried making another homeowners association in our neighborhood. Is OP screwed? Zero dollars in HOA reserves, supposed to buy smoke ride and get paid. Question, how screwed are we? The backstory, we purchased our townhome in our hometown in California in April 2022 when it was an insane market. By the time we received the HOA disclosures, we had been well underway with the escrow. We reviewed the financial stuff and saw that they only had $27,000 in reserves budgeted for the fiscal year ending 6 22 We really liked the place and this was our like 20th offer, so we decided to continue with escrow since we were already so deep in and like I said before, the market was just nuts. I've tried to be involved and informed from the start. There has been a total of two board meetings since we've been here in April 2022. The first one I attended was a super awkward 5-10 to 10 minute Zoom call cut short due to drama between the HOA board and the old property management company. The other meeting I stupidly did not attend because I misunderstood the meeting notice and thought it was for the board only. I'm still learning the ins and outs of the HOA. Ugh. Anyway, so long story short, I just found out that we have nothing in reserves. From property management, they said, see attached income statement for the month of February. You will see that the association has no money. I don't know where the membership would expect the association to get money to make repairs, like roof replacement, drywall, decks, and so on, that so many units needed due to the crazy rain we just had. 
a fully funded reserve for an association of your size with the components that are the association's responsibility is approximately $350,000, and at the very least, you should have over $100,000. As of this email, after paying for the mini deck repairs that were done in the complex due to the rain, the association has $203.93 in the reserve account, with $14,735 in pending bills to be paid for roof repairs. The balance of the operating account, which is where the monthly assessments are deposited and the monthly bills are paid, currently has a balance of $3,740.98. If we have no money, how long is it going to take us to build a reserve of 100 to 350 grand? Decades, right? Gosh. Oh, so I think it just, it is what it is. I can get on the board, even though my job is very demanding and home life with a toddler is bonkers. I think it would be best if I volunteered to be on the board. The president already asked me twice. Commenter drops the answer. Usually when this happens, it's shortly followed by an increase in HOA dues. The amount of increase will depend on how many houses are in your development and what your reserve goal is. In your case, it sounds like you may be seeing a few hundred dollars increase in HOA fees. HOA forcing me to paint a second time, posted by Garlic Jays My Dad. December 23rd, yes, two days before Christmas, my HOA served me a notice stating that I had two weeks to repaint my house as the colors were fading. I didn't have the cash or the time to have it done in two weeks, so I asked for an extension, which the HOA denied. I somehow found a painter that had an opening just after the notice expired, and the HOA agreed to let it slide. My wife looked for collars all day, and I emailed the swatches to the HOA for approval. They approved the new collars, and the painter started work shortly after. I spent my entire savings and had to work extra to cover the painter, but they did a good job, and we were happy with the results. Now, a week later, the HOA has given us a notice that the collar of the house is not the collar that was approved, so it must be returned to the original collars. After some investigating by me, the collar on the walls turned out to be a bit bluer than the grayish blue swatches would lead you to think. It's still a nice collar, so I asked the HOA to just approve of these collars, instead to which they denied. My question is, what can I do about this? I feel as if I'm being targeted for no reason. The HOA just repeats, please return the house to the original collaring, whenever I contact them about this. I have nothing left to pay for a painter a second time, nor do I have the time or materials to paint the whole house myself. The HOA is not backing down on this judgment. Should I be getting lawyers involved? Anyone else been in a similar situation? I'm checking with my painter to see if they mixed up the paint somehow. I've been here for about a year and my only other violation was a fence that needed power washing that I completed in a matter of days. I don't think anyone would be out to get me. I'm Latino and I live in a primarily black and Latino neighborhood. Only about two dozen houses total. I'm going to request a formal hearing with the HOA. All of my communications with them have been very impersonal over email, so maybe after stating my case to them, they will understand. If they choose to escalate, I'll be getting a lawyer involved. I already have a friend doing a bit of digging. Commenter asked and OP answered. They approved in writing? If so, I tell them to get lost. And OP says they approved the collar swatches from the manufacturer, but they disapproved of the collar once they saw it on the walls. What would you do? Let me know. HOA moved in on my uncle, posted by Lil Bit Evil. About 25 years ago, my aunt and uncle moved into a new construction single family home neighborhood on a half an acre. About six months after they moved in, he was informed that his neighborhood was being taken over by an HOA. He disregarded his HOA application as he did not wish to join. Not long after this, random neighbors began complaining to him directly about his boat and the cars in his driveway, violating HOA rules. He just informed the often rude people that he was not a member, that they would argue with him that everyone was a member. One of the major issues is that his driveway, garage, and front yard was on the main level of his home, and the backyard dropped down a cliff to level with his basement and backyard. So he had no way to back his boat around the side of the home into the backyard. Eventually, the HOA began harassing him with threats if he didn't move his boat to the backyard. His backyard had been closed off by a vinyl fence. The HOA installed and lined another road back there. 
So one day, my uncle decided to compromise by trying to take down a section of his back fence so he could make a gate for boat parking access. The HOA called the police on him for destruction of property. The police left my uncle with a warning if the fence was returned to proper condition by the end of the day. Uncle put the fence back up and placed his boat back in the front driveway. Now the fines started coming, week after week, month after month. When the fines reached $10,000, the HOA filed a lawsuit against him. He countersued for the harassment and the street access to his backyard. In court, the HOA showed the HOA boundary and showed my uncle's house was in the middle of the HOA, explained the violations, and the police report filed over the back fence. My uncle explained that he never signed up for the HOA. He moved into the neighborhood before the HOA existed, never gave them permission to fence in his backyard, provided all mortgage documentation and a blank HOA application with the HOA security stamp and date. The HOA argued that it didn't matter if he didn't turn in his application because he was within the HOA's borders. The judge declared my uncle's property was grandfathered as private property and not part of the HOA. The HOA was to immediately take down their illegal fence on the back border of my uncle's lot. Since the HOA had fined my uncle 10 grand and more in illegal fines, my uncle was owed over 10 grand in damages for the harassment. My uncle rebuilt his yard fence in see-through chain link with a gate where he parks all his toys in full view. He moved the boat from the driveway to his front lawn, let the lawn die, and paved it over, all 10 feet from his front door to the sidewalk. The HOA neighbors in the decades since still approach him to complain, and he just tells them to take a walk, knowing there is nothing they can do to him. This is beautiful. Normally the HOA tries to run over you and take advantage, but no, he stood their ground and won. Nice job. Click my next crazy HOA Karen compilation on your screen to continue your listening session. Thanks for checking this one out and see you in the next one.